going to try to spend the next 10 minutes talking about um, why I think um, one of the big things in terms of commercial space uh, that's coming down the line is actually a small thing. Um, so specifically, I'm talking about the, um, the NanoSat <coughs> market. And um, even though it exists right now, uh, there's a supply problem because um, the launch industry is, is focused elsewhere uh, for lots of reasons. Um, and so the ZIG plan, our vision is to um, supply the nanosat market with uh, the world's smallest orbital launch vehicle. Um, so th about the market, um, it, the graph there is, is launches of satellites less than 20 kilograms in the last five years. And the, mm -hmm. um, the nanosat market has gone from, as you can see, just a handful of launches five years ago uh, to the point that uh, next week, as, as some of you may know, um, there's a scheduled launch in Russia on a, on a converted ICBM of 15 CubeSats from academia and um, I believe a couple of commercial companies. Um, and those, you know, all the kinds of things you expect to see from small satellites. Um, the, the market this, this year is about two and a half million dollars. It's, uh, it's a little hard to pin down depending on how you count the costs in terms of launching in Russia. Is it just the launch costs and whatnot? And um, we think that uh, in years that market could easily be eight million dollars um, for lots of reasons. Uh, standards development, miniaturization of electronics. Uh, you can do a lot more with a lot less these days than you could just, just five years ago. Um, and then hopefully we can um, provide some supply, supply stability and, and market, address the market in such a way that uh, it can grow. Next slide, please. Um, So how did we get to where we are today uh, with the nanosat market? Um, the graph there, you can see that obviously, as we all know, most of the satellites that are launched uh, are big. In this case, uh, between two and 6,000 kilograms. That's, um, you know, weighs more than 100 and, uh, and on up. So those are very big. And um, the smallest launch vehicle available in the United States has a payload of about 375 kilograms. And, you know, as a result, if you want to launch a, a one to three kilogram satellite, you have to, to share a ride. And um, so obviously the guy that's paying $11 million gets a lot more say in when you launch, where you launch, and um, those kinds of things. But despite that, there is still clearly um, almost a, a bifurcated market there uh, with a significant number of launches at, at the small end of the spectrum. Uh, so, so what's our, um, our strategy? Basically, um, to, to play the pun, it's an economy of scale. We're going to build a small vehicle to address this specific market. Um, and obviously, small vehicles are cheaper to develop, they're cheaper to operate, uh, they're cheaper to set up, they launch faster, all those kinds of things. Um, and we think we can do it uh, for a reasonable price. Start small, uh, <coughs> servicing basically a single pea pod or a five kilogram satellite and, and go up from there to do the whole range from, from 20 kilograms down. Uh, and then ultimately in five years have the, the highest launch rate in the industry and the lowest cost per launch, uh, almost an order of magnitude, uh, than, less than, what, than what, what's available now to orbit. Um, so the competition, uh, obviously the, everybody knows the uh, first three names there um, and, and their business model, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, federal government contracts, communication contracts. Um, there's some, some new vehicles in the, in the pipe, um, one that everybody's heard of and one that maybe not so many people have heard of uh, from Alliant Tech Systems, but those are still very big, addressing this market. Um, 
you know, several hundred kilograms, uh, 400 to, to in that range. Um, and then, you know, the space startup companies, uh, which have a, a pretty different business model on, on, on the whole, uh, but uh, they're no slackers. And if they decided to, they wanted to compete in this market, uh, I'm sure they could. Um, so our financial plan, um, basically it's based around year development uh, schedule. Um, at the end of, of FY3, we would be, um, sorry, I come from the government, that's fiscal year three. Uh, we, would, we would be cash flow positive um, and hope to have, at, at the end of five years, about 40% of that market um, that we think there will be uh, at $3 million in, in sales. Okay, so where we are, um, we have we have what we think is a mature design concept. Um, we have a well-defined path to how we're going to start with a small uh, project and and go all the way to orbit. And um, we don't have, if you look, when we look at our development plan, we don't see any big boxes that say uh, miracle happens here, um, and and then and then we have a, <laughs> a rocket um, and. What we've been working on lately is um, some propellant, hyper-propellant performance testing to get some data that, that you just can't find. It's not published. Uh, it's, n it's not that it doesn't exist. It's just not available on the open uh, literature. Um, so the management team, and I'll, I don't know how much time I have left. OK. Um, myself, uh, my, my current uh, professional experience is uh, I was at the uh, Naval Service Warfare Center uh, as a civil servant, um, working on the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense Program. Uh, I was working uh, on the team that was responsible for the, the terminal guidance uh, propulsion system for the hit-to-kill warhead. Uh, in graduate school, I did uh, research for NASA on air breathing uh, propulsion technologies for uh, space launch applications, RBCC, and the RBCC. Um, my partner Jason Liu, uh, currently at uh, Craft Tech, excuse me, <coughs> uh, which is a small company outside of Philly, also worked on the Aegis uh, program, um, doing performance uh, envelope missile performance analysis. Uh, he's a testing guy, and then um, Dr. Heister from Purdue University. So. Um, what we're looking at here, um, we're currently raising our first round of capital, our angel round um, of $150,000. And uh, what we will get out of that is a year, uh, within a year, we will have flight tested a, a prototype module, which um, demonstrates all the major subsystems that we need to build an orbital vehicle. Um, the second round we would raise after we'd completed that flight testing and uh, demonstrated our technology. And um, three years uh, to integrate the prototype into uh, an orbital vehicle and um, get to the point where we're, we're making more money than we are spending. And uh, so, so to wrap it all up, I mean, the vision here is that um, we're going to develop the world's smallest um, space launch vehicle. Uh, it's an orbital vehicle <laughs> so that um, the nanosat market can mature to the point where um, it can ma mature to its full potential because um, I think it's really, it's really stymied right now uh, because, you know, you just, if, if you're a company, I don't think you can go to an investor and say, well, I, I have this great idea for, uh, for launching a satellite in orbit, but don't know when it'll go, um, and I don't know where it's going to go, and it might take two or three years. Um, so hopefully, uh, with this kind of capability, the, uh, the smaller than 10 kilogram satellites can <clears throat> really become, you know, true commercial pro projects where you see constellations and things like that. Thank you. Assuming you can.
meet your projections in five years, what's the company worth at that point? Um, well, I must admit I'm an engineer and, and not an accountant, so uh, I, uh, as far as I can tell, evaluating a va valuation of a company is, is a very subjective thing, so I, honestly, you, you probably know better than I do. <laughs> I'm sure you know better than I do. To, uh, creating a new market or going after an existing market that is not served appropriately? Uh, the, the second option. I, I think, um, you know, clearly there's 25 um, nanosats going to be launched this year. And um, I think given the choice, uh, a U.S. entity that wanted to launch one would much rather launch uh, with a U.S. launcher because of ITAR and, and um, all the issues of, of launch. Uh, with a, an entity that's all the way on the other side of the world in a, in a different uh, country. And um, so I, my personal uh, opinion is that if, if the supply was there, a new market would emerge. But uh, we're not creating a new market. I mean, the market is there. And I think we, sorry, but I think we can be profitable even if a new market doesn't emerge. Why is it then uh, that it's, it, it may, the question may sound kind of awkward, but why is it that it's only an $8 million market? years if uh, you know if it's an existing <coughs> market and presumably growing with uh, you know with folks like like yourselves is that is that because you're not you're not pricing it properly that you're leaving money on the table and you should be charging more because the pain is there oh, I, see, or, I see what you're saying um, or it's just that it's, it's fewer academic I mean, it's basically academia that's interested in those those types of experiments basically yes my, I think th that that um, I hate to sound uh, trite, but um, I'm, I'm a kind of cautious guy, and so, um, you know, my my projection there is based on, you know, the current market growing, and um, I think the we're not trying to compete on price with the Russians because I, I think that's a losing game. Um, so it's not that we're undercharging; it's just that uh, if you take a look at the market that's there now today, and you extrapolate out, you know, you get eight million dollars. There seems to be, I think, in the years that follow, um, I'm a firm believer that nanosat technology will continue to grow drastically, not only within academia, but also in the commercial sector. But there are plenty of ideas of companies and others that are thinking through the launch aggregator business, meaning that they would aggregate launch demand from academia, from commercial entities worldwide, and allocate that demand to launch companies, such as the commercial Sea launch and the Russian entities. So, given that a lot of nanosat technologies could be used in very large constellations on the order of tens or even hundreds of nanosats performing certain functions, and the application list goes on and on, do you foresee that uh, companies with larger payload capacities, such as SpaceX or Sea Launch and the like, would also become more competitive in the nanosat market because they're launching a hundred or more nanosats versus the one or two? Launch aggregators can help funnel demand so that uh, the customer themselves, the nanosat customer, doesn't have to wait for launches but can actually follow a set schedule. Sure, I, th I think there's a lot of complex issues in that question. Um, gee, where to start? Um, one of them is that uh, <coughs> it, it, all, it will, one of the laws of, of engineering and, and rockets in particular, and if, if anybody with me, they can talk to me out line, but is that um, a bigger system costs more to develop, and I don't mean, obviously it costs more, but it costs more per whatever metric you want to use, pound, uh, thrust, whatever it is, um, and, and that's, that's an observed law of, of, of engineering, and so um, it's always cheaper to develop something smaller first. Um, there's also the issue you are putting a, a, a constellation up. Some constellations can be put up um, where you launch 100 satellites on one rocket, but there are some where you can't do that. If, if you're trying to get global coverage of the Earth, it's, it's kind of hard to, to do that with one rocket and 100 nanosatellites. So you really need more launches. Um, and there was one other point I don't remember <laughs> out of your question, but. 
What more can you tell us to give us confidence that your company has the ability to, to build this vehicle? I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning of the question. Um, what more can you tell us um, to give us confidence that uh, your company can build this launch vehicle? As opposed, as, is the question what makes us special or what makes the idea special? You can tell us both. Okay. Um, well, the idea, the, the thing that's special about the idea is um, I think we have a plan that borrows on some history and I, I won't go into too many nitty gritty details, but I, I really feel strongly that we have a good plan that, um, that you know, you, you start with concrete, small concrete successes and eventually it, it goes forward. I mean, one of the problems you see with um, some of the projects is is they do this and, and that doesn't really, I mean, it's neat and it's cool and it, and it does, you work, but it doesn't get you farther to where you want to go. And uh, so I think our plan is special in that. Um, the management, um, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you other than, um, you know, um, it's what, it's what we have experience. Um, I, I don't really, I don't claim that the, the, the team is complete. I, I really think there are some components missing there. And definitely a lot of the work will be um, subbed in some way or another. Not a lot, but, but some. Um, we're not going to bend metal ourselves, you, you know, pay people to fab, that kind of things. So um, I, I don't, I, I won't stand up here and tell you that, um, that we're going to do all ourselves and we're going to be great and wonderful about it. Um, but I, I think we can do it. <coughs> Aside from that, I, I don't really know what to tell you. There were two things that I really liked about your, your plan. One is you only do one thing. To a lot of companies in this business that are going to do this, that, and the other thing, and everything else. I like that too. And that begins to look like something that venture capitalists like. You know, it's focused. Okay. The, uh, the second thing is that um, I, f I thought there was a large uh, pent-up demand for this kind of thing because the shuttle has been unavailable for a long time. A lot of things were designed <coughs> to be flown the last five years and, and really haven't, the schedule hasn't permitted to fly them. And also, as, as uh, someone mentioned here, for those of us who track nanotechnology, there's a lot of things that are becoming possible now with a five kilogram or 10 kilogram satellite that before would have been. And also, um, yes, there are larger uh, vehicles that are available where you could put lots of satellites, but the insurance company isn't going to let you put your little experiment next to a $250 million communication satellite. They'll never let you do that. So uh, that, those launches are just not available. And it will, you, you, you would be filling a, uh, maybe I'm rewriting your business plan here on the fly, but you'd be, you'd be filling a, a very interesting niche. I, I just, not smart enough to know how big it can get. But mm -hmm. once you're, you're there, you may reveal a pent up demand that just isn't, uh, you know, hasn't been qualified. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with every, everything you say. Um, it, it's just that a lot of that you don't really have evidence for, so I, I tend not to try to say things that aren't defensible. But yeah, I mean, I think that's the real um, potential is that, is that um, this could really open up a very large market uh, that's, that's sort of being suppressed. And, um, but I think the real strength is that our business plan doesn't depend on that market opening. So if you were funded, um, who is the next person you would hire? Uh, a controls engineer, probably. As opposed yeah. to a marketing person? Well, I mean, in our first year, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a development. It's, it's an engineering exercise. Um, so I don't foresee a, an immediate need for a marketing person. Uh, your, your comment, uh, Jacques, reminded me of, of, of issue with um, putting lots of satellites together is you have to make sure that they don't interfere with each other. Um, one of the problems with, that CubeSats have now is they have a lot of qualifications they have to go through because they're designed to fly with very expensive uh, CompSats and uh, so that just drives the cost up. So the more satellites in terms of raw numbers you put together on one launch, the, the larger of an integration problem you have. I'll just add that seems like the, the point that you made earlier as well is that the advantage 
this model is that customers would have access to the schedule on their terms versus the larger launch, launch uh, access companies as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. 